Um, good morning. I want to thank you for the invitation to come and speak here. It's uh, meaningful to me, and I hope it will be useful to you. When I decided to come and accept the invitation, I had questions from colleagues in different parts of the world saying, why would you go to Hong Kong for this kind of meeting with the teachers, the primary and secondary schools? But why would you do that? And I, uh, I indicated there were two reasons, and I'll tell you now my reasons. My first reason is that I believe we are in the middle of a cultural war in education. We are in a division between the STEM disciplines and the creative disciplines. And my feeling is that how we solve that problem will tell us a lot about the future that we face. And design plays a critical role in this, and design at the secondary and primary levels will be the decisive factor for our future. We must solve this issue because the future depends on it. Yes. Yes, Michael. All right. I like it. I have a second reason also. My second reason is that I, I've been to Hong Kong in the past uh, 15 more years ago. I come periodically. I wanted to take a temperature check on what is the level of design culture in Hong Kong. It's meaningful, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> meaningful to me, and I think it's a harbinger of progress of design around the world. And I would say that, uh, there we go. Uh, I use this as my way of judging the development. This is what I call the four orders of design, and students, Please forgive me, I'm going to talk to your teachers as well as to you. More to your teachers, I'm afraid. Uh, I use this, this way of understanding the progress of design over the past century. It's been used in so many forums to design curricula, to set up educational programs, and simply understand the progress of design. Designers have been called upon to solve two big problems early in the 20th century. Mass communication and mass production. And in Hong Kong, we developed the first and second orders of design in the areas of graphic design, it worked. My God, it worked. Uh, the communication through images and symbols and signs and the construction of artifacts. This is a great accomplishment of Hong Kong and we know its success. Those areas have tended to be narrow and focused because they serve particular interests and problems. But my feeling is that we have moved now to what I call the, the third and fourth books. Why that? There we go. The third and fourth orders of design. We are moving down, down into these areas. The third and fourth orders of design. The third order involves human interactions. How we interact together. How we design our human interactions. Designed education. Oh, thank you so much. What a cool guy. I'm going to use some water too. Uh, and how we design services and other processes and practices. We get very much human involvement at this level. This is the third order of design. And this began for us in the design community in the 50s, the 60s, as we began to think about how humans relate to computers and machinery. But then we became more interested in how we interact as human beings together. That's the third order of design, and that I think is beginning to emerge in Hong Kong with significance. By the time of the 90s, we began to realize that not just the individual interactions, but how we create the environments, the systems, and the platforms of human interaction become critical factors. That's what I call the fourth order of design. And I will tell you that uh, I began working on fourth order design projects in the late 90s, working on a redesign of the Australian taxation system. And I've watched progressively over the last 15 years how projects all around the world have become fourth order design projects. A very different kind of design work than is familiar to graphic designers or industrial designers. We're looking at designing the communities that we work with, the systems within communities, the platform, the environment of education. So these are important measures to me that Hong Kong has indeed moved to third and fourth order design issues. Not abandoning the classic work in graphic design, interior, and industrial, but now focusing on new issues of how we relate together as people. I will say there was a third matter that occurred to me as I rode the plane over from the United States, I was suddenly struck with a huge irony. And I doubt if anyone here understands quite the history of what you're doing now, but let me tell you something serious. In 1919, a great American educator and philosopher named John Dewey came to China. He came to spend two days. He stayed for two years. He went to Beijing and traveled all across the, the schools and cities of China. He educated a number of the great teachers of China, and he introduced a new way of thinking and learning. Learning based on what we do, what we make, and how we do things together. Uh, it's a remarkable transformation, 
and his students went elsewhere in, in uh, China and established great schools. Three or four years ago, I was invited to a high school in mainland at Wuxi, and I went there, and they have a campus of five or six buildings. I went to the administration building, and on the wall, the huge three-story wall, there were 11 propositions in Chinese. Each proposition was derived from John Dewey. John Dewey is philosophy of progressive education, learning by doing, by making, and by thinking together. 11 propositions. That year, the Ministry of Education in mainland, in the PRC, selected that school as the best high school in all of China. And I want to tell you this, it is a school that refuses to teach to the scores of tests. It teaches the way to solve problems, yes, exactly. It teaches the way to solve problems, to think creatively, and it combines the STEM disciplines with the creative disciplines. I have to say, I was very, very inspired by the students today. I, I was just blown away by that. Such great accomplishment. I have such respect. This, to me, is an expression of the Deweyan approach to education. And to be honest, you probably don't understand this so well. You don't know the history. But John Dewey has been extremely influential in the development of design through the 20th century. His approach has influenced Maholi Naj with the new Bauhaus. It's influenced many others. I'm a student of a student of John Dewey. Ah, yes, that's right. So John Dewey is a great teacher, my own teacher, a great teacher who learned with John Dewey, and I was a good student of a great teacher, John Dewey. <laughs> so I am uh, very pleased and struck by the irony of being here with you and a chance to celebrate the success of this work. I want to show you something, though. I look at this as three pillars of excellent education, the way we bring this union of STEM disciplines and creative disciplines. I'm interested in three features. These are the pillars. Diverse experiences, that our students have experiences on the playground, they have experiences in the field playing with nature, uh, working with other people, many ranges of experience with different kinds of people. That's important. Second, it's important we use projects as a way of teaching, not the rote learning of the old kinds of discipline, but we have projects that engage the reflective thinking. We do and we think about what we do, and we go back and do it more. That kind of progressive. Project education is a core of the development of design over the course of the 20th century. It's been picked up in other disciplines, but we in design know what project education means. But there is a third pillar, and I call it the design attitude, and I want to tell you most about this notion of design attitude. The concept was developed by my colleagues at uh, Weatherhead School of Management, which has been a source of innovation in management uh, for a long time, many years. Their effort is to think of managing as a kind of design activity, and they focus on the design attitude. Well, you may wonder what that is. Uh, Frank Gehry was influential for us and so forth, but, but my colleagues and some in the UK have picked up this theme and wanted to study what are the core values that constitute design education, design practice, and the way we live together through design. By very careful analysis, questioning corporate leaders, design firms like IDEO, uh, other design firms, lead designers, even talking with students, they found five core values that characterize design. And I want to share those five with you now because I think they are central to what you're doing. And to be honest, I've already seen all five in the presentations of the students. The students have wonderfully grasped what these are. But I want to tell you now, because the teachers are slower to understand than the students. <laughs> you know what I mean very well. There are five. One is the ability to see the whole situation. That's why the diverse experiences are important. We stay not within the narrow confines of a classroom, but we have wider experiences. Anything that engages us in more things that we're curious about. Second, there must be passion to bring ideas to life. There must be that passion. We must cultivate that. Third, there must be a willingness to take risks. And I will come back to this in a moment because this is a very telling matter. Fourth, be open to all of the senses, to explore all of the senses. Sound, touch, smell, taste, sight. Explore all the senses in searching for solutions. And finally, five, the concern for others. This is the element of empathy we've talked about. Now, this list is boring to me. This is an academic list. I, I, I don't like it much. But we've tried to convert this to what is a self-assessment matrix. And I hope that these slides will be made available to anyone who inquires. 
because this, this matrix, this, this star, tells us a great deal. And here's how we use this as a self-assessment tool, whether it's for individuals or for curricula or for organizations. And perhaps even there's a way to think about it in terms of cultures. But in any case, all five elements are on the star. And we ask for a metric when we test this, and it's been tested many places in the world, on a scale of zero to 10, where do you stand in each of these values? And we ask for honesty in this, we ask for it in students at the beginning of our education, and then we ask for it at the end of the education. And we find, and I'll, I'll show you an example of this. So for instance, you may make a mark and you draw the connections. Like I'm very strong in ability to see the whole situation, or I'm very weak in using the senses to explore. But it changes over time. It changes over time. Remember I mentioned I would go back to risk? One of the curious things we have found is that at the beginning of an educational process, students are willing to take risks. They place a very high number on willingness to take risks without knowing the outcome. They'll choose a seven, eight, or a nine even. At the end of their education, if they're in traditional schools, that willingness to take risks drops to two. Oh yes, oh yes. In design classes, design programs, it does not drop, it increases. That is a shocking matter. We have tried hard to understand why that happens. It is a, there are several hypotheses, I will grant you this. <clears throat> Even in a business school format, at the beginning of business school, MBA program, very high willingness to take risks. Jesus, I'll take on the world. By the time they finish the two years of MBA education, it drops to two. And why does that happen? What do we do to drill out of the students that willingness to take risks without knowing the outcome? Well, this is the subject, again, of great investigation and inquiry. But I would suggest there's problems in education land when we take away the willingness to take risks. Now, I think a risk as informed risk taking. It is not just taking risks wildly. That is not it. But when we have an understanding of the whole situation and relations to people, we begin to think of informed risk taking. It's informed risk taking. Are we willing to try new ventures? And I found this in the students today. I was so impressed with the younger students. And they have a willingness to take chances and do things. They're, we haven't drilled it out of them yet. Yet. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yes, so we must be cautious about that. You're right, there are many ventures to solve the problem of the STEM creativity blend, but I would say that design has long-standing value for us and there's a pathway forward. We have to take great care in this. I want to say again, just in conclusion, that this matter of 100 years of development in the West and the East, through a curious combination of experiences in both, because to be honest, John Dewey left China and it changed his way of understanding philosophy and education generally. He became concerned with culture as well as with the creative aspects of life. So it's a blending of East and West. Now I don't care whatever you think about that. We all are in this together. And, and add to this, I believe very deeply that there is room for everyone on the boat. There is room for everyone on the boat. Some of us have great capabilities, some have modest skills, modest aspirations, but there is room for everyone on the boat, and we must design for everyone. Not for the elite, not for the middle, not even for the lower bottom, but for everyone. That is our great challenge as designers. I think I've kept within the time. Steve, have I done that? Perfect. Let's find some questions out here. Thank you very much, people. Good. Good.